one. Hi all, this is Theoretically Podcasting, and today I'm joined by Hank Chen from Perimeter. Hi Hank, thank you for joining me. Hello, a pleasure to be here. So could you briefly describe um, where you're at right now and what your research interests are? Um, so I'm currently in University of Waterloo and affiliated with um, PI, um, Perimeter Institute in Canada. So my research, um, it's kind of all over the place. Um, so I'm a mathematical, um, I'm in mathematical physics and my supervisor is Florian. And we focus on, um, so I'm doing a PhD and we're focusing on kind of like doing this, this categorification uh, program for quantum doubles. So quantum doubles are essentially um, half algebras that are, um, that kind of underlies the symmetries of quantum theories, like just very broadly speaking. And it has very far reaching applications in various areas of physics, like particle physics, condensed matter, quantum gravity, et cetera, stuff like that. And in particular, the main application for such structures is for example, loop quantum gravity, where you want to, you know, canonically quantize geometry, essentially. That's what LQG is uh, basically doing. Um, but I'm also interested in like the various uh, roles that such like quantum double, general double structures can play in condensed matter, right? Because we know that, for example, in topologically ordered systems, you can construct um, BF theories uh, or like defect gauge theories, which has that structure and also describes certain symmetry predicted topological phases as well. And there's also a categorification story there where um, you know, that, that you can tell for like the three plus one D uh, SPTs. So that's kind of where my yeah, research is going. Very cool, very cool. Um, yeah, no, tell Florian I said hello. Um, but today we won't be covering uh, almost any of that. <laughs> <laughs> we will yep. talk about door twisters. Which, I mean, you can draw a line to some, if not several, of your interests. Uh, you know, they, 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 there is a sense in which self dual yang mills self dual gauge theories and gravity are some, some version of BF theory. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely, they've played, Twisters have played a role in various constructions of spin form models. So um, there's some of that. But um, yeah, I guess... I guess we'll we'll dive into it and uh, we can go into their various uses knowing what they are first. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's begin. Um, yeah, let's let's begin there. Um, so I have some notes which uh, I think we can go over to get through the basics relatively quickly. Um, and then we can get to some of the things you're interested in in this world. Uh, so I'm mostly using Adamo's notes on lectures on twister theory. So it's lecture notes on twister theory. Um, and very basically, the starting point for all of this is uh, four-dimensional Minkowski space and the role of spinners there. And uh, much like was discussed on this podcast before, uh, there's this very simple correspondence one can draw between vectors in Minkowski space and uh, these spinner objects with dotted and undotted spinner indices uh, where the translation between these two indices happens through this uh, generalized um, poly tensor, if you'd like to call it that, where you basically take all three poly um, usual poly matrices, add on the identity, and then you take this resulting four vector, which then has two spinner indices dotted into any given vector, and you're left with the following. So this, this innocuous formula will actually be very useful in all our analyses to follow. But, but basically, if we're just doing this in Minkowski space, then what we would do is take basically the zero and three components, add them, subtract them. The one and two components form complex conjugates of each other. So a form a complex variable out of them, take the conjugate in the other entry. Nice thing is that the determinant of P ends up being uh, the uh, norm in the Minkowski metric uh, of the vector we started with. So for instance, if you had a null vector, then we're going to have vanishing determinant, meaning that the rank of this, this matrix 
is uh, less than two. Since we're in two dimensions, it's got to be like one, and you have a factorization of a null vector into a pair of spinners. So uh, that's, yeah, that, that's kind of like the spinner helicity um, backbone to the rest of the story. And the metric is now in this spinner space split between, uh, well, okay, let me be consistent with indices. Uh, it's split between um, the dotted and non-dotted indices, but now there's it's a four tensor and it's just a product of the two epsilon symbols acting on these two spinner spaces. And the epsilon uh, symbols themselves are metrics on the spinner spaces, right? So that's, that's the story of two spinners in Minkowski space. The fun comes when you just complexify everything. Right, so instead of taking R13, we just say that it's it's actually just some real section of C4. And then, well, C4, you think of as two factors of C2, where you think of these independent spinners as living. Right, so, so generically, if we just took what would be now, right, so, so if from the perspective of complexified Minkowski space, right, we, we can still write down a condition such as this which still means what it normally means, except now all the components are like um, are complexified. So I, I still define the metric to have the same signature putatively, right? Um, so I, I still say that this is like whatever, P0 squared um, minus all the rest. And then if I say that that's zero, then it'll still translate exactly, even though I've complexified everything into saying determinant P is zero. But here, right, the only imposition that this has on p as a matrix when you write it in this uh, spinner form is that it's of rank one right so it's, it's got to be a product of two now independent spinners so you have zeta and c c tilde with a dotted and undotted index the other way around right so, so these aren't necessarily related they are related when we're trying to embed a particular real section that's minkowski space but mm -hmm. otherwise they are just whatever they are and that will be important in the whole twister construction. So it all sort of starts from just complexifying everything, right? Okay, cool. So let's get into what those real slices are, right? First, it's just Minkowski space. So here we, I mean, it's just what we discussed where very honestly, every one of these things, the, the P's, the various P components are real. Meaning these two are complex, these two are real, right? Which means that if we took the conjugate of this, or just the conjugation operation, we're naturally transposing, right? So, so P ends up being permission just by dint of the fact that all of these components are real, right? So provided that we're just taking a real Lorentzian form for vector and writing it in this way, we have permission matrices in, the, in this two twister space. So that's, that's the conjugation operation. What it does is it switches dotted for undotted indices. And, and this is actually special for the Lorentzian slice. It doesn't happen in Euclidean. It doesn't happen for the Klein signature, right, which is a neutral signature. Um, so that's, that's going to play an important role. Um, and of course, you can just embed R4, right? But, but if you want to embed R4, then what you'd want to do is define a conjugation operation in the following manner, where P is now not, are not necessarily real. Right, right? Usually you do with rotation, you take the zero component and then write it as an imaginary number times something else, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that we're opening the door to these P's not being all necessarily real. And in fact, the reality condition here, right? If you say who's, so let's just define some abstract conjugation operation defined by taking a hat, right? So I take my P, I take a hat, and then this is what it looks like. Um, the reality condition to say what's preserved under this is a condition that tells you how to embed R4 into uh, C4. That reality condition is satisfied when, in fact, instead of just taking like what we had in the Lorentzian signature, where these two combinations were just of real numbers, we make these complex as well. Usually you would think that the... Wick rotation turns P into an imaginary number. We've just taken out an I overall. That's why the I ends up being on Q. So we've taken out a minus I, strictly speaking. Um, and then we have 
still these two directions involving uh, complex numbers. So every, everything, every entry by itself is a complex number. And now the P0 and Q1 to Q3 are all real, right? So, so that's the conjugation. That's what is invariant under the conjugation operation. But that conjugation operation no longer mixes dotted with undotted. It just permutes the entries within each spinner. So, so that there are no okay. The, the downside or the upside is that there are no real spinners left. So, the, in, in Euclidean space, that you just have these complex spinners which have this funny conjugation operation that squares to minus one, right? Because if you see, you go a b minus b bar a bar, which then goes to minus of a b. If you do it again, right? And this is actually secretly the representation of like elements of R four as quaternions. So, so these mm -hmm. are kind of the same thing, right? It's it's just that this is like a matrix representation of what would other by otherwise be written in terms of the three kinds of quaternions, right? So so the the choices between like you know there's these two kinds of choices one makes when writing spinners in Euclidean or Lorentz and signature involving certain eyes, <laughs> right? And uh, forming a very similar looking uh, sigma. But mm -hmm. but that all, I mean, that, that all is the difference between defining or not the quaternionic bases, boldface i, j, and k. So R4 is like the slice of um, C4 where there's this quaternionic conjugation at play. Mm -hmm. And then there's like actually the totally real slice, which is actually R2, 2. So the neutral signature space, I just is everything is real. Basically, all it does is kind of the opposite of what we did in the Euclidean case, where now instead of having an I on P2 here in this combination, we just turn these also to be real. So so like what you have to get the determinant to represent P0 squared plus P3 squared minus P1 squared minus P2 squared is just have plus minus here and plus minus here everything is real. And so that's that's what makes this client space special. Mm -hmm. And now you see we've sort of exhausted all of our signature options, right? Like there's no, yeah, R13 is the same as R31, and then there's R22 and R4, right? So, so that's mm -hmm. that's everything. There's also like minus R4, whatever that means. It's just, you put a minus in front of the metric. It's not very interesting. Um, so this uh these basic facts will carry over to twister space which we haven't defined yet right so this is all preface of yeah. what to it's do just, with c4 it's just spinners so there's a pretty nice way to think about all these uh, um, spinners and reality conditions so <clears throat> the fact is that if you the the, the lorentz group and let's mm -hmm. say four dimensions and in whatever metric there's a double cover of the Lorentz group, let's say SL31 by yeah. SL2C. Right? Sorry about yeah. that. And SL2C, as we know, is, you know, it's two exactly. copies of SU2. Yeah. Right. So, so it's that's, like... yeah, the mapping it's... of these P's to these spinners matrices is yeah. essentially the double cover. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, if you take SL2C, and then you restrict to so there's a what's called a Cartan evolution of SL2C. Mm -hmm. It's you know so simple and um, stuff like that. There's a Cartan evolution, and you take the real slice associated to that evolution, you get just SU2, like it's a real compact form, and you get the Euclidean die, right? That's right, exactly yeah. where the quaternion enters in because SU2 is unit quaternions. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so no, there's that's very, precisely what it is. Yeah. So there's a very nice, um, very nice um, story there to tell, which generalizes to other dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have, um, let's say you want to look at mini spinners or mini twisters and two plus one B, you can do the same thing. You can try to um, introduce spinners where um, your SO2 one group, the Lorentz mm -hmm. group in 3D is actually double cut over by SL2R. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, yeah, so it's a real group now, which has nothing to do with the quaternions. And so the twister structure in 4D and 3D are actually completely different. So it's right, right. kind of surprising. But 
nevertheless, they're so both very interesting. Indeed, yeah, no, thanks for that. I mean, I guess we, one can actually show that, like the when you actually look at the uh, inner product on Twister space, right? In, in based on which reality structure you take, it's going to be invariant under different subgroups of essentially S O two C, right? So, so you you would you would have these, um, yeah, you would kind of recognize what's going on when you're when you're when you're in this slice or when you're in this slice or when you're in that slice. In fact. It might well. The funny thing is that here, right? These things, the twisters corresponding to them, we'll see are like they all live in some subspace of RP three, <laughs> and you know they're they're really just their their inner product is invariant in their SL three R. Mm -hmm. So there's probably some like simple dimensional reduction relating this, ironically, to the twisters of uh, of three D. But yeah, I wonder if anyone's played that game. Uh, I'm sure somebody <laughs> has. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I guess we're just getting to what twisters are now, um, which, you know, there's some subspace of CP3, which, you know, one should think of as uh, being coordinated locally um, by some four complex numbers up to a um, rescaling relation, where the rescaling is by a non-zero complex number. Right, so so that's those are the, the coordinates which we shall represent instead using uh, two spinners, one dotted, the other undotted. So this is like the classic representation. And right now this is a sort of definitional relation that a twister within CP3 is a pair of dotted and undotted while spinners related by what's called an incidence relation. And this incidence relation, it works as simply as this. That you take some, like we we're using P, you can say some R, which is part of the complexified Minkowski space. And then we'll write um, that the R is somehow, for lack of a better term, a kind of ratio of these two. <laughs> I mean, the, the, what it really is, is just the relation in this incidence mm -hmm. relation. And... Um, We'll take that to be our, our definition. So another way to just write this is basically as you give me some dot alpha, uh, alpha, comma, zeta, alpha. Right, so, so that's that's what our, our twisters are. And one way to see them, another way to see them rather, is through this double vibration, right? So you take the space of projective spinners. So you take this projective spinner bundle, which is over the complex of Edmund Cox space. You have fibers that are spinoral, but then this is projective, meaning we're again modding out by complex rescalings. And then, well, the simple projection down to our original um, complex of Edmund Cox space is just forget the second argument this is what you would expect the spinner bundle to mean whereas the incidence relation defines the projection map down to the projective twister space right this projective twister space because of that relation baked into what zeta is right so that's that's what makes it projective mm -hmm. uh, and throughout the rest of this these notes twister space and projective twister space are treated interchangeably we're almost always talking about the the projective version um, and now we have some basic points to cover, which is any point in complexity in Minkowski space corresponds to a line, a CP1 in twister space, projective twister space, really, right? Because starting with some R, so say we held R fixed, then really we're going to have some plane within C4 defined by the pairs of mu alpha dot and zeta alpha that satisfy the incidence relations. This is actually going to be some C2 within C4. But then you realize that you have to have this uh, projectivization. So you have this kind of uh, quotienting that you need to do. And that quotienting takes you down from this this plane down to P1, CP1. Mm -hmm. right? So, so that's, that's kind of how there's a correspondence between points and lines between the Minkowski space, complexified Minkowski space, and twister space. 
And mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of, well, you could think of CP1 either as a line or really as a Riemann sphere. And this is like Penrose's favorite picture to draw in all of his talks and whatever is that, well, you have this nice relation where every point has associated to it some CP1, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then there really is the interpretation that you can see that CP1 as the celestial sphere of an observer living in living in Minkowski space, which again mm -hmm. has to do with what you described, that is the relationship between the Lorentz group and SO2C, right? That you know, you you either think of the you either think of SO2C as telling you something about the Lorentz group, so double cover the Lorentz group, or you think of it as the conformal group, the two sphere. Right. And the it being the conformal group of the two sphere naturally tells you that there's this uh, CP1 that you can interpret to be the the celestial sphere of an observer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that 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 insight has done a lot uh, for the various applications of this mm -hmm. of this technology. But now let's figure out what to do in reverse, right? So well, what do tw twisters correspond to in Minkowski space? Right, so we just described that. Well, you fix a point, you can have like uh, you know CP one worth of twisters, really. But now let's say we fix twister, right? So we have mu alpha dot. So let's take two points Q P, right? That correspond to the same twister, which means that we have mu alpha dot being P lambda, but also being Q lambda. And so Q minus P lambda is zero. That's what it means to have two points corresponding to the same twister. Now, generically, lambda is not zero. So, uh, you know, like, what is the other option? The other option is that Q minus P, so either Q is P, right, which means that we have to, we're talking about the same point, or Q minus P is proportional to lambda alpha, right? So lambda alpha dotted with lambda alpha, because we're contracting with epsilon, equals zero. Mm -hmm. So... Q minus P is a null vector, right? It's a null vector in the complexified Minkowski space that takes that generic form, uh, which we discussed, right? The vanishing indeterminate, meaning that it has less than full rank. And what we really have are that corresponding to any given twister, there's this completely null plane mm -hmm. in the complexified Minkowski space that are known as alpha planes. Um, and allegedly in some references, there's also beta planes that correspond to the dual version of this uh, under a duality operation that I'll describe a little bit later. But anyway, they're these alpha planes, right? Uh, so that's, that's fun. Um, now these alpha planes, they really honestly exist in the complexified Minkowski space. Uh, they, they, they reduce down to nothing in, uh, Euclidean signature. Because there's no uh, there's no way for them to intersect. We'll see that there's just no way for them to intersect. R4. They intersect uh, Minkowski space with Lorentz signature at a line, whereas in Klein space they're just planes. It's real plane. So it's like um, it should take the plane nature of them with a grain of salt to aid our visualization. But here there's a nice exercise one can do to actually see how to use this relationship right between um twisters and points and vice versa or you know like points in twister space versus uh, planes in the complex Minkowski space and vice versa so here if we wanted to specify a point in the complex Minkowski space there's a fun little construction uh, of a by twister which you know like having information about a line is like having information about a pair of points on that line, right? So you can form a bivector out of that information. And in twister spacers, call it a bi twister. But uh, anyway, if you do that, right, with two twisters having the same x, right, but different lambdas, right? So, so again, we're just saying that mu alpha dot is just x. You're using the incidence relation here to define it. So we just compute this by twister and discover that, okay, so you use some tricks and discover that it's just given by the following uh, object. So we have the, the sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between what the twister information is, that is some scale set by lambda, 
right? So this sets the scale, and then you have just the information about x, you know, the x alpha beta dot. And uh, this can be inverted for a relationship between x and lambda in, um, in when when you look at twisters over R four. Like this this is kind of an important relation for whatever whatever one does. Um, so this this is just a sort of geometrical tool to say that you know lines in twister space correspond to points in the complexified Minkowski space. <laughs> So then we'll get to basically seeing how all those reality structures we were looking at with just the spinners will carry over mm -hmm. to the twisters. So this is the classic Penrose um, view of twister uh, theory. Like if you if you ask him what twisters are, then he doesn't really care much beyond this <laughs> realm. Uh, so Lorentz signature, if you're given a twister, right, then conjugation swaps the dotted with the undotted, right, as we discussed. And it's useful to actually define incidence relations with an I out front. So this is just sort of, just for this little subsection, we're going to put the I here. Um, and the reason for doing so is that we can define both for twisters and for their duals, where we're swapping the dotted and the undotted, um incidence relations one with an i the other with an with a minus i right so, so so let's say we have a twister given by the pair mu lambda mu being the dotted then there's the following incidence relation but then we can have w a dual twister where we have uh, now uh, lambda tilde mu tilde then we have the following incidence relation with a minus i so that we can define a dot product between Z and Z bar. So Z bar naturally sits in this dual twister space. Right? So this mm -hmm. is a natural pairing between them. And Z, Z dot is just given by the following formula, where if you look, we have I R minus I R uh, permission conjugate, right? Just, just from defining the following thing. So if we take the real Lorentz signature uh, points and put them in here, we know that those are the ones that are Hermitian. So this vanishes, right? Which means that Lorentz signature in Minkowski space is just the space of null twisters corresponding to this, uh, this operation. So, so we call it... Yeah, we call it PN, where we have twisters that are zero when they're dotted to their conjugates defined through this conjugation relation. So, so it's this conjugation relation. And uh, this is kind of fun because, you know, I think this is sort of the jumping off point for saying that you can basically use twister space to think about the space of complexified null geodesics and so on, you know, like there's like the phase space of complexified null geodesics and so on. This mm -hmm. I think is kind of like one of the one of the reasons why these things are all related. Um, and that that's sort of a very major starting point for the story of ambitwisters, ambitwister strings, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and also why it was just has anything to do with massless amplitudes. There should be some relation to the space of null geodesics, right? So it's it's all mm -hmm. kind of related. Uh, and alpha planes just cut, uh, cut this uh, Minkowski space at a line, right? So, so we literally have a correspondence between twisters and rays. So twister was an alpha plane in complexified Minkowski space, but in just real Lorentz equation Minkowski space, it's a line, right? So it's like light rays are twisters, whereas points in Minkowski space are CP1 in the uh, twister space, right? So, so this this relation is the one that Penrose will always show in his slides. You know, this is like what he was super hyped about. Um, but it's not the one that is mostly featured in most other applications, uh, including the whole twister string story, which was much more concerned with the Euclidean signature story, right? So, so it's basically more concerned with how understanding how to embed uh, Euclidean signature um, R four into uh, twister space.
And here we have a conjugation operation on crystal space that is inherited from what was going on with the Euclidean spinners, right? So here we don't swap dotted with undotted. Instead, we just shuffle the entries and change signs. That was what the hat operation did. And we're just going to call that Z hat. Right? The action of sigma is just to take Z to Z hat. And the sort of quaternionic nature of these objects means that sigma square is to minus one. Right? So that, that, that was why uh, this had anything to do with quaternions. Um, so the issue is that there's just no, no point that's preserved under this operation. And so you, you just find that, well, obviously there are no, well, you can't talk about anything being null in Euclidean signature. The, the zero vector is null and that's it, right? So there's nothing real that can be null. Only things that are complex can be, can be possibly null. Um, but that's okay. We can't associate points with anything. So points in projective crystal space correspond to nothing in R4. But lines correspond to something, right? So, so lines in PT have the following relation, right? So you basically form the bi twister XAB with Z and Z hat. And you see that this is actually real, right? that the conjugation leaves it invariant. So with that, you can use twister and its conjugate under this operation to specify a point. Right. And and this is just this is just a way of seeing how twister space is a CP1 vibration over R4. Right? That's that's essentially the the argument here. Um and this relation just drops out of knowing how to construct X like we did before. Mm -hmm. And the neutral signature client space is boring. It's just all real. So, so this, this relation is satisfied identically because X does equal X bar here. Right? So it's, there's just nothing. It, it, it's just the real subspace of twister space. So you just have RP3. Um, and and that's, that's basically the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Now, given you have some reality structures, of course, the more interesting question is what complex structures you can form. And this is sort of like probably what's used in most of the applications of Prisoner Space to say, understanding self dual solutions of Yang Mills theory or, or gravity or whatever else. And <clears throat> basically, so yeah, so as we discussed, the projective uh, twister space of R4 is the projective spinner bundle, meaning that we have the CP1 vibration over R4. And that means we can basically define a uh, notion. So, so having a complex structure is a way to split tangent cotangent spaces into, um, you know, spaces, you know, spaces corresponding to the Z and Z bar. Exactly. Yeah, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. Mm -hmm. um, and so here we have uh, the following that in PT, the we, we basically have basis um, vector fields given by the derivative with respect to the overall scale and this contracted derivative in space. Right? So it's like the directional derivative along the spinner uh, direction and the derivative with respect to the information about the the overall scale because that was uh, that was also in this in this essential relation, right? So this this is like this is a way to define what what this d bar operation is. Right? So that spans uh, t zero one, um, and the space of zero one forms is kind of the dual to that. Right? So uh, you have a nice little Dolbo operator, which is kind of like specifying holomorphy, right? It, I mean, its kernel defines what you mean by holomorphic mm -hmm. um, functions, forms, etc. And you can basically, so, so that's that's the way to carry over, like what, what it means to define derivatives with respect to uh, twisters, right? So that's that's basically given by the following uh, the Dobo operator. And this is sort of like what you would use Oh, and of course, uh, the integrability of the complex structure 
meaning that it's not just an almost complex structure, it's just the um, closeness of, uh, yeah, well, the exactness of this of this differential. So d bar squares to zero. Uh, and I guess this is a great jumping off point for what you were uh, looking at, right? So um, yeah. the correspondences that you were, uh, you, know, you were kind of interested in. Um, but it's it's also sort of the jumping off point for you know how one uses twister theory to mm. talk about self dual and anti self dual um, sort of solutions to yang mills equations and gravity and mm. whether one can even talk about the quantizations of those they're all just based on preserving these structures and their quantizations right right in fact um i think one of the most striking Maybe I can share my screen. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. So I think one of the most striking uh, features of Twister theory is that how you basically capture the causal structure of Minkowski space time or whatever Absolutely. space time you want. Yeah. Or whatever space time you want to look at, like uh, crying space or a client space or uh, whatever, the Euclidean space. Um, you capture that with the complex geometry of Twister. So I think that's um, Indeed. very interesting in the sense that, like, so there, there are people, but, but this is, of course, you know, we're leveraging the fact that we, you know, complexify Minkowski space, which, you know, some people in the quantum gravity um, community is kind of um, not very positive on, <laughs> but... Nevertheless, They'll get there eventually, but yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, <laughs> we got to convince them, yeah. But the, the key point is that, like, all of the twister geometry, all of the key properties, like, like for example, how points um, in Minkowski space correspond to, like, these sections, CP1 sections of twister space, and also how points in twister space correspond to, like, null planes in Minkowski space. Um, all of this arises from the incidence relation, right? So right. basically all the twister geometry arises because we have, the, uh, we have the incidence relation. So I want to just make a brief comment about why that's a thing. <laughs> so basically what we want to do is that we want to look at the celestial sphere, which are um, no lines, right? From let's yep. say your, your server in... Um, in Koski space, and then you look at all the null lines in the celestial uh, sphere, which is spanned by all the null lines that you can see. So, for example, let's say you're in 2D, and then you just look at, you know, you're playing and then time going up like this, and then your celestial sphere is just a circle, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a, a light bulb. So, but in 3D, of course, we have a full sphere. Um, but nonetheless, you want to represent the positions on this celestial sphere in terms of S2, right? In terms of S2 variable. And yep. here's exactly the formula um, that you want to, uh, like on, on each patch of the celestial sphere, you use these uh, U1, U2, U3, which are essentially generators of S2. And you represent them as a complex CP1, which is the Riemann sphere, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the fact is that if you have two observers, and you want to look at, okay, I have two observers and then let's say their uh, local frames are related by a Poincaré boost, let's say. Mm -hmm. Which is to say that they are separated by like a constant velocity frame, um, constant velocity um, Lorentz transformation, let's say. Right. Uh, so in, in that case, then how are their celestial spheres related, right? It turned out that the celestial spheres are related by exactly by this modulus transform, which is SL2C. Indeed. Yeah, which is, you know, double covers the, the Lorentz group, right? And so this is the motivation for why we define um, the incidence relations this way, because we know that two observers, which are represented by these spinners, like these coordinates on the celestial sphere, Z0, Z1, which are the, the mu and lambda that you define. Mm -hmm. Um, in your notes. So these two guys, this is in 4D, right? So right. these two guys are related by a Möbius transform, which is parametrized by the double cover of SO2C on the Lorentz uh, group. 
Right. And this is exactly the, 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 the spinner R uh, alpha alpha dot. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and there's also an I here, which is, you know, cool. <laughs> Yeah, 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 but, yeah. So but, this yeah. is the Lawrence. Yeah, this is exactly the Lawrence section that we we're discussing. But yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, exactly. So this motivates why. Um, okay, so motivates why. Okay, the incidence relation is so fundamental. It's because you know we motivate them from actual special relativity, in the sense that you know. Okay, so I kind of construct. We kind of constructed to search geometry from the causal structure of Minkowski space. Right, because the celestial sphere is completely just, it, it defines what null means, right? Mm -hmm. Celestial sphere. And then I can take that celestial sphere and then define the geometry on my twister space using the incidence right. relation. But what I find very striking is that the converse is true as well. And in the sense that, okay, you just take a, um, a twister space, let's say you don't know anything about your causal structure of your original space or whatever, you take, mm -hmm. you know, you, you take your twister space and you define, as you said, the the, the null twisters. Yes, yes. Look at, and then you look at your twister correspondence, and it turned yeah. out that this all the complex geometry on PN here actually gets you a vile structure. So not just the conformal structure, which you know determines the uh, causal structure. It turned mm -hmm. out that not only that, you also get a compatible uh, connection. Uh, which is compatible with this uh, conformal structure. So that's a vowel right. structure. So you kind of essentially get, um, I don't want to say all of like general relativity, but it's pretty close, right? Yeah, well, that actually is, um, it relates to a lot of, I guess, almost contemporary work on this on this topic, which is understanding how how to construct full general relativity and whether it can be thought of as living truly on twister space. And to the best yeah. of my knowledge, so certainly there's a story involving self-dual gravity, right? Which is which mm -hmm. is kind of classic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the point being, if we're just talking about, um, if we're talking about just definite felicity states, right? So then... It's very easy to embed them into twister space, and then the equations of motion become basically some version of closeness under that Dolbo operator, right? So the, mm. that that becomes so, so you can essentially use the cohomology of that um, mm. Mm. corresponding to that differential to talk about solutions to self-dual Yang and self-dual gravity uh, equations yeah. of motion. And this is encoded in what's known as the Penrose transform, which I might we, we could get to, or you know that I thought I would even leave that to to another uh, episode because there's there's of much course, uh, to talk about there. Um, but when it comes to full general relativity, there are some interesting recent papers which I have not unfortunately paid enough attention to. Uh, I think by people like. Uh, I think people around Lionel Mason, maybe, was it? Um, Atul Sharma and some, some other people. Uh, it's very recent stuff, um, which, which, I would like to, which I would like to get to at some point. But uh, if I may share your, what you mentioned about the correspondence um, to the conformal geometry is, yeah, it's, it's basically continuing along... Um, what what we were discussing so far. So now I'll just jump to like Adamo's lecture notes. And here he describes um how one can use the basic geometry of twister space, give it a complex structure, and infer what the conformal structure of the underlying uh complexified Minkowski space is gonna be. So the complexified conformal group in four dimensions is SL4C. And now you see it's uh, you can form these invariants, so you can form the invariants of SL4C quite easily uh, in twister space because you know you're, you're actually endowed with like these four Zs, uh, and you know it's kind of natural to say, okay, I mean, what's what's the natural sort of set of linear transformations on this mm. uh, space? It's going to be SL4C, right? And, and he even mentions that, but the generators. Um, so, so the invariance, of course, just given by taking epsilon of all of these, right? It's like a, 
it's like a wedge product between all the Zs. Um, and the generators of SL4C are just linear um, on the space of Zs, right? So this is very similar trick to what one does to linearize the conformal group um, by going to embedding spaces. Right, mm -hmm. so the conformal group in 4D is based on whether your signature is real, uh, well, if it's Euclidean or Lorentzian, it's either SO3 one, SO4 one, or it's SO3 two. Mm -hmm. And uh, the transformations on Minkowski space itself or on R4 of the con con involving the conformal group are not linear. Right? Mm -hmm. Specifically, if you think about special conformal transformations, then you have there are some really complicated kind of uh, generators, but what you can do is go to an embedding space and take the SO4-1 case as a very clear embedding space where that becomes a linear transformation. And that's the one higher dimensional hyperboloid, mm -hmm. which you could think of as a de-sitter space, which yes. kind of, um, where these just act as Lorentz transformations in some sense, right? So the SO4-1 kind of act as Lorentz transformations on the one higher mm -hmm. dimensional space. And that's the trick here in twister space, except what we're doing is we're looking at the complexified conformal group, which uh, is SL4C. And um, yeah, so basically you have this TAB object, which is all you really need. Kind of crazy, right? I mean, if, if you just take Z to TAB, ZB, right? So this is an SL4C transformation, then yeah, of course it's gonna be generated by just this TAB. Um, and here we've only talked about Z, not Z bar, right? So that's the sense in which the holomorphy matters, right? So that's kind of an intuition. Um, but again, breaking everything up, we can actually represent the individual generators of the conformal group in terms of the spinner. So we break up the twister into its spinner components. And then you see, uh, importantly, we have, uh, well, we have some some obvious ones, some not so obvious ones. So, so the, the the generators of the rotation group, which are sort of, uh, or the Lorentz transformations, which are symmetrized um, combinations of like lambda and d lambda, or mu and d mu. Um, normally, you would write these in vectors. Like if you're writing this with using like vector generators, you'd have an anti-symmetrization between like say mm. the linear momentum and the. Um, yeah, well, yeah, between like derivatives and the coordinates. P just corresponds to lambda d mu dot. Funnily enough, the special conformal transformations are <laughs> not that complicated at all, right? They're just like mu alpha dot d lambda. Mm -hmm. The dilatations are literally a homogeneity. Uh, they're just a count of like what the homogeneity degree is. Uh, yeah. in terms of the spinners. So the difference between the number of lambdas and the number of mu's mm -hmm. uh, appearing, or the powers of lambdas and the powers of mu's. Yeah, so that's, that's that's kind of you kind of super neat. That. Yeah, exactly. You kind of expect mm -hmm. that. Uh, but but it's, it's very neat how it ends up being uh, sort of very simple, right? And, and it's basically mm -hmm. just taking this relation and breaking it up, right? Like you just mm -hmm. interpret different components of T as different generators of you know, SL mm -hmm. of the conformal group. That's all that's happening here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, okay. Right? Like, oh, that you just, yeah, that that's it's easy. And now, uh, conformally flat metric is just a wild factor times the, mm -hmm. oh, it's the line element. So it's a wild factor times the flat metric. Um, and what we basically do by making this identification, so going back to this basic exercise involving the bite twister, um, is we know that we can actually write ds squared as just epsilon dx mm -hmm. dx, right? So, so it's like x being information about a ray in twister space should give us, or a line in twister space should give us information about a point mm -hmm. in the underlying uh, complexified Minkowski space, which means that dx or ds squared should just be square with respect to the appropriate structure of mm -hmm. um, yeah, of these by twisters, right? So it's like dx ab, dx cd with epsilon, mm -hmm. which is sort of the only way to make sense of this. Um, great. And basically, the point is that this isn't an accurate 
representation of the full Minkowski geometry. It's only a representation of the conformal geometry. Mm. Right. We basically have, um, yeah. So, so this is the point make, uh, oh. being made here. So it's like, well, this metric is flat. Uh, so is it the Minkowski metric? And the answer is no, because, well, um, X are not really the space-time coordinates. It, there's space-time coordinates up to a scale corresponding to the norm of lambda. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's that scale information. Um, so this is not homogeneous of degree zero. Uh, so what we should really be doing is dividing by this thing. For some, and, and here comes an important structure that we haven't touched upon yet in these notes or in, in anything, which is IAB, this infinity twister. And um, yeah, it plays a super important role in, in some related constructions in ADS or DS. Um, mm -hmm. it, becomes, it becomes much simpler, actually. Uh, so anyway, the, the idea is that um, 2.26 really isn't the Minkowski metric. It's actually the Minkowski metric rescaled by this lambda squared, this, this lambda 1, lambda 2 squared. Um, so it's conformally flat not quite flat so twister geometry as you mentioned just this is like the easiest way to say it. twister geometry just gives you information about the conformal structure mm. right so so it's like here being like another another way to put it is that being insensitive to f is equivalent to being insensitive to this overall scale right so it's like that that's what the conformal geometry knows about mm -hmm. um so let's see um Okay, conformal flat metric, blah, blah, blah. In order to get a metric in a particular conformal structure, we have to write the line element in a projectively invariant fashion. So since this uh, has weight two, you'd have to find some i for which you can divide this by um, x squared. But now, mm -hmm. now literally x squared x, you have to turn, a, turn into a scalar. Um, and here they say that this metric singular at the hypersurface i x equals zero, which defines a set of points at infinity in the usual sense of conformal compactification. And this is also very deliberate. Like you see this, that's why it's called the infinity twister, because uh, its kernel tells you where infinity is, mm -hmm. right? And note that the person who came up first with this conformal compactification uh, procedure was Penrose, who also came up with twister theory. Right, so it's a kind of a very deliberate uh, construction here. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is essential to break conformal invariance on twister space, this I. Um, and, okay, I mean, it's kind of like saying that, um, you know, being able to put infinity at some finite distance requires you to break uh, scale invariance in some, mm -hmm. in some sense. Because, yeah. you know, infinity is defined in some scale invariant fashion but you know you, you, you're, you're literally taking the place where this is singular so yeah of course there's something special about that um so let's see i mean yeah here that's that's basically the point mm -hmm. so for the conformal structure of mc in twister space you take the this choice which is actually this kind of singular choice right so this this degenerate choice um, and the nice thing about this choice is that i x is lambda one lambda two, which is exactly what you need to cancel this overall conformal mm -hmm. factor, right? So you could have done this the other way around, right? You could have started by saying define the following, take i x, it defines lambda one lambda two, divide d s squared by that thing, and then you will get exactly just d x d x, the line element on Minkowski space. Um, yeah. So. This infinity twister is a very useful gadget, but the fact that it tells you something about infinity is subtle, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of related to the conformal compactification story. You have to do an infinite while transformation to get to infinity. This is the idea. Um, so, right, right, yeah. Yeah, I think this, but, but, um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say that th th this fact of like conformal compactification sort of introduces um, like, like a similarity and infinity, which is, um, I don't know, like the, 
at, at least for the people that I've been talking with, like the QG people, um, like the I, I think this is one of the reasons why they don't like compactification so much. Um, because I mean, I'm perfectly fine studying twisters um, by themselves, right? Mm. Because and I'm perfect. I'm perfectly fine with um, encoding the vowel structure or the mm -hmm. conformal structure, just the causal structure of Minkowski space using twister geometry. I don't. I don't have to get like a projectively well defined metric. Mm -hmm. I don't like that's. Uh, um, at least for me, that's that's not such a big deal, um, because to me, the complex geometry of twisters is is the fun part. <laughs> right, like, right. Uh, well, yeah, it depends on your motivation, I suppose. And what you know, you can really get away as so long as you're talking about like massive stuff. You know, you're you're fine. You can just kind of get away with thinking only uh, about the conformal geometry. But when you have to deal with anything else, it kind of becomes an issue. And certainly, yeah, yeah. It's like if you want to talk about general relativity, for instance, where it's not a wild invariant theory, then it kind of becomes a, a real issue if you don't have the structure. But, you know, here's a fun thing. Um, mm. <laughs> notice that there's a zero in the top left argument here. That's kind of like, okay, so, so what would happen if we didn't have zero there, we would have something with dotted indices only. Mm -hmm. Its coefficient is a co cosmological constant. That's basically the <laughs> that's basically the infinity twister in uh, in ADS or DS. You have the cosmological mm -hmm. constant times epsilon alpha dot beta dot. And then all of a sudden, what happens is that you have this really cool correspondence where it's almost as if forming the Dirac spinners of the one higher dimensional, yeah, like the one higher dimensional um, Minkowski space will give you, so, so you know, you can embed the sitter space and anti sitter space as different sections, like some, uh, is it as a hyperboloid of positive or negative curvature in mm. a flat Minkowski space, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or with a space of some funny signature for ADS, Lorentzian ADS, but you could in ADS is fine, still Minkowski space in one higher dimension. Um, in that one higher dimensional Minkowski space, if you take just Dirac spinners, right? So Dirac spinners are ways of like pairing up. Uh, they're another way of pairing up uh, wild spinners, right? Where that makes sense. But but if you do, those are the twisters of ADS or DS. So the ADS, DS twisters are literally like Dirac spinners of the embedding Minkowski space. And their infinity twister will have a lambda here in front of the alpha dot beta dot argument. Uh, so that's just like a little fun story mm. of uh, how to play mm. there. And, you know, like there, of course, the thing is you have to talk about infinity sort of in relation to the ADS or DS radius. Right? Mm. Like, you know, you, you want to reach the boundary, then, you know, you're talking about like, it's as good as talking about super ADS scale or super DS scale, right? Like, you know, right, right. that's kind yeah. of the, the curvature radius tells you is, is a scale compared to which you have to talk about infinity. So that's why mm. that's one of the reasons why you can kind of intu intuitively think that that's, that's there's going to be a lambda there. Um, mm. But yeah, more uses of the infinity twister right here. Okay, I think that they even talk about it here, but anyway. Um, so uh, line in PT... Uh, for which the following happens means that, well, Ix is uh, lambda 1, lambda 2, where lambda is where lambda 1 is proportional to lambda 2 for the same reason that we had that vanishing argument mm -hmm. all the way back then. Um, <clears throat> so these two points lie on the same line x in twister space, and the only way that their undotted spinner components can be proportional to each other if, uh, is if they're both zero, meaning that when this happens, um, the points lying on x have this form, right? Mu comma zero. Um, so they, the incidence relations uh, have to be obeyed. And so if lambda is zero and x is finite, well, then mu is also zero. So there's just no way for the incidence relations to be obeyed uh, unless x is at infinity, right? So that's, that's like another cross check of this intuition. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was yes so there was some wisdom to all of this uh that that penrose uh, kind of used in some of his constructions 
which uh, I'm, I'm not fully aware of and I, I would like to at some point uh, <laughs> interpret. But um, yeah, this is kind of a way to see that there's the con that the complex structure of uh, twister space is related to the conformal structure of the underlying uh, space time. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that complex structure is just a way of specifying what, what it means to take derivatives with respect to Z as opposed to Z bar, right? So all that is just annihilated by D bar, right? Because D bar is this thing, <laughs> derivative with yeah. respect to Z bar. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th there's this super cool relation. Um, and I mean, it's not that different. I mean, this is like a four dimensional version of similar thing that happens in two dimensions, mm. which is if you take just real, well, if you just took, uh, Riemann surfaces, then the conformal structure, right, is related in a very nice way to like, uh, this. <laughs> the space of complex structures, right? So the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And that's why, well, actually the intention of string perturbation theory is to capture the integration over conformal structures. It just so happens to also be <laughs> in two dimensions, um, mm. the moduli space of complex structures. So, so it's like a very similar co coincidence being used um, just in two lower dimensions. Um, so that I guess twister space kind of takes that up a notch. Um, so yeah, and the the next stage here is to look at basically the the Penrose transform, which goes to what we were describing before, that you have these uh, this, this relation between um, self dual theories or anti self dual theories and theories on twister space, um, and you'll note that these theories are indeed conformally invariant and that's why they're related to holomorphic theories in twister space. So that's, that's like a, another sort of confirmation of this, of this intuition. Yeah, yeah. I think the whole story is, uh, is indeed a very, um, how do I say, it's very, um, like if you accept certain stuff, <laughs> then the, the whole story is very beautiful. But Twister's theory yeah. is, uh, by, by itself is for sure very uh, one of the most attractive uh, things. And I can see why some people um, just are, are just drawn to it. I want to do you know, general relativity using Twisters, but um, nevertheless, again, another kind of more intuitive way to see how um, the geometry of Twister space determines the polar structure is that you know, you have, um, let's say you're given two points, right? Mm -hmm. And goes to the space. And we know that points correspond to uh, these CP1 sections or CP1 lines in Twister yep. space. And it turned out that if you use the incidence relation, and if you say that, okay, um, they only, the, the twisters only, uh, the, these lines rather, intersect at one point, then you mm -hmm. see that the, these two, points that you've chosen on the Mikoska space must be uh, nullly separated. Or right. null, null separated, exactly. Um, so this is, you know, using Lorentz theorem slice. But um, on, on the other hand, if you say that, oh, they're actually timeline separated, then you can show that using the incidence relation, again, that they actually intersect each other twice. So not just once, but twice. So the the CP1 lines in terms of space kind of go like go like this, and then another one goes like this, kind of. So they yeah. intersect at, at like the ones at Z, the base point, uh, and ones at the uh, the complex uh, the, the complex conjugate on the base mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. a very very nice symmetry there, and also the converse correspondence works as well. Right. Yeah. So the, this twister correspondence, you can essentially use the kind of like the intersection of these sections mm -hmm. to reconstruct the causal structure on the Kursky space. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. No, that, 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 that is super cool. And it's actually, it's actually a sort of interesting point, which um, is, this is really just pure speculation, but uh, since we're discussing, since we're, we've both been on the intersection between like general mathematical physics and uh, and the spin forms and the quantum gravity, 
Um, there is a story. So, so one thing that's just not been resolved in the spin film literature at all is the anomaly associated with imposing the simplicity constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, yeah. it's yeah. just there, and then well, it's there. That's that's yeah. to the best of my knowledge. This is the status. I'd be happy to be corrected. Please leave a comment below. If you know any more than I do, uh, but uh, you seem to agree. Now, funny thing is, there seems to be okay. So, so there's. You could probably just sort of go through the entire construction, um, the spin film construction to adjust the self to the sector, right? Like, uh, in the old days, you would take this, do the full complexification actually, and then restrict to some. You'd impose some reality conditions or whatever. Um, and now let's just say, okay, just, just stick to the self to sector to play the whole game. I'm sure there'll still be an anomaly. Okay. Now there's this very interesting recent work by Fausto Piquet and also all this follow-up stuff by, uh, Sherman Mason, whoever, where for, again, Fausto Piquet, they're sort of looking at this, uh, construction of the self dual yang mills theory on twister space right so mm. the self dual yang mills theory is like a holomorphic theory on twister space and classically that's easy to show well easy modulo understanding the penrose transform quantum mechanically there's an anomaly mm. and that that anomaly appears at one loop twister space is six real dimensional so as you can imagine Anomalies came from triangle diagrams in four dimensions. Uh, they're hexagonal diagrams in 10 dimensions, which means that in six dimensions, they're going to be box diagrams. There's some box diagram to compute, okay? And then you get, then you take the variation of that and there's some transformation mm -hmm. and you get like an anomaly. And that, it has some coefficients involving, you know, like coxeter number, all kinds of whatever, so some, some characters, something. And so... You know, as always, there's some special gauge group for which they it's cancelled. There's there's a Green Schwartz mechanism. Uh and apparently you can cancel it by coupling self dual yang mills theory to some very funny kind of axion that has a quartic kinetic term. Mm -hmm. okay. Cool. Now, what I don't know is how that all works for the case of self dual gravity. I would be surprised. I mean, I'm almost sure there's gonna be an anomaly. All right. There's some box diagram there too. There's gonna be an anomaly associated to that box diagram. Uh, does it have anything to do with like, you know, like just to just go blindfolded into doing the, the sort of uh, spin form quantization of just self-dual gravity, right? And, you know, self-dual gravity is like, this is just BF, uh, <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, BF, you have simplicity, you have some part of the simplicity constraints you have to impose. I don't, I don't even know if you have any actually, but probably do. Um, so are these related by any by any means, right? That, that would be an interesting story. And is there mm -hmm, some funky mm -hmm. axion-like field? I, I'm sure that there's literature that I'm just not aware of. So somebody's, they're watching this going like, no, of course, it's this and that. Well, again, comment below, please. Uh, <laughs> but th th that would be a fun thing to see, right? Like, I, uh, Yeah, you know, I mean, I, in, at least to my, um, at least to my um, knowledge, let me just, Kind of just repackage the what we mean by anomaly when you want to quantize the, uh, the simplicity condition. So essentially, in the first order of formalism of gravity, you have a, as as you said, it's a BF theory, but the B has to restrict it to come from free fields. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that's essentially the simplicity condition. But then it turned out that if you quantize BF theory. And then you try to um, look at the Poisson algebra that is generated by the by, by this theory, and then you try to do like a Dirac quantization of this theory plus the simplicity constraint. It turned out that you can't do it. It's contradictory in the sense that the um, the simplicity uh, condition is actually a second class constraint. It's not first class. Right. So your Poisson mm -hmm. brackets are actually violated. It moves you away from the Cauchy surface. Which is a very bad thing. <laughs> if you want to do time localization, it's terrible. It's hard. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's not hard. It's impossible. <laughs> Let's just say that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the you'll find is, literature saying you can yeah. do anything, but <laughs> in truth, <laughs> is, reality is a bit hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's the, the thing is, this is you know, without 
without any uh, what is it without any uh, I guess magic tricks or say of hand where you embed things into like higher dimensional space or whatever and then you use the you utilize the complex of the the complex structure this is without doing that right right and then you uh, you know it's actually you, you can't do it uh, at least classically you can't impose strongly so what people within the spin foam um, community do uh, for example you compute uh, EPRL amplitudes mm -hmm. is that we impose simplicity constraint weekly semi right. yeah using you know um, expectation values so, whatever that means yeah. yeah 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 whatever that means you know in classically whatever that means at least you know you take h bar goes to zero and then you get the usual Platini in action so like, yeah, well, you see, I mean, my issue cool. with that is that, like, there never is an anomaly that bothers you at the classical level by the mm -hmm. definition of what an anomaly is. <laughs> That's sort of always been <laughs> my issue with it. Yeah, I mean, usually, usually when you take H bar to zero, I mean, like, every anomaly kind of goes away, you know, but... Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I'm really wondering more if there's a, some non-trivial mechanism, like, if there's some version, at least in the self dual sector of this kind of um axion field that um mm. Russell and Paquette have been talking about which has some maybe some very funny kinetic term but fine uh that that achieves the cancellation of this anomaly that that would be so interesting because it's a, it points to some bizarre extension yeah, yeah. of of gravity right I, I i don't yeah i mean maybe there's just something as i said like i i really think there might be a paper out already where this question has been answered one way or the other. I would just really love to know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think no. because there, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, like the work by Clay and the stuff that we've been talking about with Ryan and stuff like that. Essentially, the idea is that you can, so in electromagnetism, there's a hidden one form symmetry, which is generated right. by the magnetic flux. And um, the idea is that you want to kind of encode the Bianchi identity mm -hmm. as a kind of like a two curvature condition, like two okay. curvature condition. So now what is happening is that these anomalies that arise as contributions to your original curvature, which is F, kind of becomes like a gauge freedom when you introduce this uh, two form uh, connection. So once you have this one form symmetry and then you write down a theory which is invariant uh, two gauge under this two gauge uh, theory then uh, what you will find is that some anomalies are kind of not there anymore like you can resolve your anomaly mm -hmm. by doing that yeah and, and so this is how the, is this yeah. is this i mean like intuitively to me this sounds like a way another way of seeing the inflow or the inflow mechanism um yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that would also be a great way to understand the resolution to this problem. You say that there's a higher dimensional Chern Simons like theory, mm. which to mm. which this is some kind of inflow, and that, yeah, I mean, th there's all sorts of fun things to possibly do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. No, that, that, that would be, that would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, the thing about, the thing about like the thing that's hard about the simplicity condition is that like the frame fields aren't really connections like unless you you know you generalize like carton connections and you have a yes. carton structure it's not really a connection so and also the simplicity condition is quadratic in the in, in the quote unquote connection which is yes. your frame field so I think that's what makes this whole story of uh, anomaly cancellation difficult, because I, yeah, I don't think, uh, like at least uh, intuitively, um, if you have BF and then you have mm -hmm. like a yeah, if you have if you have like an anomaly which is mixed FF, then I can see a ring Schultz anomaly cancellation by introducing this B, right? Transformation, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, cancels it, but that's because you know this this Simons term is linear with respect to the anomalous f right. right but yeah but the the whole anomaly associated to the simplicity condition is quadratic 
So it's quadratic in E, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, no, no, I certainly see that back. It, it's not a simple resolution, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah, it, and it's all there are all sorts of confounding issues such as okay, I mean, having something quadratic in E, if you were in three dimensions, wouldn't be an issue. You can dualize it, have something that's linear. You yeah, know, the dual, and you can play yeah. some game, but this is clearly not true in four dimensions, where in fact you will get back something that's again quadratic if you wanted to dualize mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 actually it's actually quite tricky. Um, yeah, so that's it's nice that we got onto this topic. <laughs> I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, this was her area, but I mean, to, to make it clear to listeners, we should say that. We met over Discord, which uh, <laughs> has has been a theme because you're the second guest on this podcast whom I met on Discord. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice. that's that's been fun. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, we should certainly have uh, more discussions on this topic, and uh, I, I certainly will come back for the mm -hmm. and uh, related stories. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, thank you for joining this time. Thank you. Yeah, for thank you with for your time. Me. Yeah, I hope that this was useful to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. And if you've gotten this far, please do like, share, uh, yeah. subscribe, and comment. Um, this is Theoretically Podcasting, and I'll catch you all next week. Yep. See you. <laughs> See you.